Chris, thank you for taking the time talking to me. Absolutely. It's been over 20 years since I have been, is that correct? Or was? Probably, was probably, at, yeah. Sorry, my, my English. Um, was at your farm. And it was the first time that I was exposed to the concept um, of organic farming, off the grid, and so on, permaculture. Mm -hmm. Permaculture. I had heard of that because uh, a guy in Salzburg, an Austrian actually, was big in the field. But it was Holzer. Right, mm -hmm. Mr. Holzer. But it was all kind of theory, and in, in my surroundings especially, um, it wasn't, you know, it was something that some freak, Steve. Yes. Um, um, things have changed since then. Uh, and can you give me an update? What do you up to now? Because you didn't only do the farm. You, you were heavily involved in the town's ecological development and its politics. In the meantime, I think you've become a county commissioner as well. Yes. So you're playing the game in larger Colorado. Yes. Uh, uh, just please catch me up on sure. what's happened, where the farm is at, where you are at before. Sure. Well, I think um, I worked at the Telluride Institute for a little while, and then I ran the nonprofit called Eco Action Partners. So we were basically the sustainability organization in the region and ran that for seven years. So we did greenhouse gas inventories. We did a lot of recycling programs. We did a lot of waste programs started even before that. I started the picking up compost from the festivals, and then that expanded immensely, um, and that's still going on. And then local food issues, since I did have the farm, the food part was always important. So I stepped down from that a few years ago, did some consulting for a couple of years. And then uh, when Art Good Times decided he wasn't going to run again as county commissioner, I considered it and thought that was something that I would enjoy doing. I had been on our county planning commission for 20 years. So I had a taste of what that was, of what you know county government did and... Um, thought I would enjoy it and, and uh, was elected in 2016 and definitely enjoy it. It uh, keeps me busy and the farm is still a going concern. I actually had my daughter here running it this summer. So we still have interns who come up and do all the work. And in fact, I'm eating a whole bunch of tomatoes right now that came out of the greenhouses. So I think since you were there, we've added a growing dome greenhouse, a, a dome style greenhouse. So um, otherwise it's pretty much the same. <laughs> Before we move on to the politics, what, or actually, it's one of the same, isn't it? I mean, it it's is, all. It is all one and the same. It's all related. It's all related. <laughs> what was it in the early years of your life that, that not, I don't want to say pushed, enticed you into the direction that you went in at a time when not many people did? True. Uh, my father was the Dean of Forestry at Colorado State University. And so I had always been really interested in the outdoor world and decided I'd get a degree in forest management, went to a different university because all the professors had known me since I was a baby. So um, I got a degree in forestry and then kind of got uh, moved to Virginia and got interested in growing food. So um, while I was there at Virginia Tech, I got a master's in horticulture and started growing food. And um, same time, kind of looking at Mother Earth News and you know how to be self more self-sufficient, self-reliant. So it's been an interest from a long time. And then when I, I missed the mountains too much and I came back, um, I was like, well, I should be growing food no matter where I am. And so even at 9,000 feet outside of Telluride, Colorado, started to, to grow some food and it kind of expanded from that and then of course the food was the basis of it but the um the energy part was important we we well they they gave us a quote to bring power in it was a quarter of a million dollars <laughs> so we're like okay well that's not gonna happen <laughs> so we're off grid you know we did the solar power thing we started very small and you know meet meet our needs through that now um and uh my sister had um been part of a community in New Zealand they started um, when they were down there and uh, I always liked that sense of sort of not quite a commune but a shared community so uh, started early on when we, our kids were little I put an ad in for some part-time childcare and some part-time farm help and that kind of expanded then into the internship where 
people come up and they live on the farm for the summer and they learn how to grow food at 9,000 feet and they learn about renewable energy and they, they learn about all the stuff I'm interested in and right livelihood. And it's been, it's been fantastic. I think this is the 25th year of interns this year, 24th, 25th. I remember there being a really uh, good atmosphere, despite that everyone is working really hard, mm -hmm. because apart from being a farmer, um, that's hard work, but being a farmer on 9,000 feet is, you know, that's yeah. a different story altogether. Many communities, many individuals, but also many groups who try to do that, you just said commune, you know, they fail. And they fail. Um, I had my experiments throughout my life. Yeah. Uh, they failed. Some friendships, okay, and remained, but generally it didn't work out. Your endeavors are far beyond an experiment. They, they are established. It's working. What would you attribute that to, apart from individuals that are, of course... Well, part of it is it's just seasonal. So it's just the summer because I'm also a partner in my sister's farm, so a farm partnership, which is some sort of commune-like. And then they also have their, they're still members of the um, community they started in New Zealand. So as we all age, uh, we're learning some lessons through in setting up a community. And it's very, it's challenging because when you're young and enthusiastic, you don't think of well, what happens if somebody, you know, dies unexpectedly or, you know, what, how, how do the children of the people involved you know, continue to be involved. So we're working through some of that, but the farm is much simpler, my farm, Tompton Farm, uh, because it's seasonal. And we just put the word out that, you know, we're looking for anybody who wants to come and learn. Um, they don't, people, they don't really make money. I give them a little bit of, of a stipend so they can buy food at the farmer's market. So it's more an educational experience. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an attitude. We definitely have had conflicts and most of them have worked out fine. And um, it's, I think it's that attitude going in one that, you know, we're, we're in this to do something. We're in this to grow food and to learn how to grow food and, and, uh, and then learn a little bit more. How can we live differently than, you know, the standard sort of, you know, this is my house and the, the yard and all that stuff. So it's, it's a little different. So it's a taste of communal living um, and the farm work, and it gives the it gives young folks because they're almost always in their twenties an opportunity to see what's involved in growing food, and also sort of the pros and cons of being in a closer community. I'm I'm super excited about the co housing movement because I think that um, that's sort of the a logical um, evolution of the commune because I think people need their space. You know, you want your individual space. And you want to be able to connect with people through shared work, shared food, etc. But you also want to be able to withdraw and retreat when you can. So I, I really, um, some of the things I've looked at in co-housing makes a lot of sense to me. And particularly as we age, it gets a lot harder to do what we're doing. And so if um, there's a new uh, community is going to start in Ridgeway. And I, you know, I just look at that and go... Yeah, as we get older, it'd be nice to have that independence, but also have that connection and and have those young folks around who don't mind shoveling a whole bunch of snow. Or <laughs> please go on a little bit. Um, Co-housing. I think we got an idea now, but but be a little bit more specific. What are the rules? Let's in, take what is being sure. set up there. How does that work? In my mind, co-housing is um, it's a community. It's and it's set up with specific rules on how you go in and go out, become a part of and leave a community. But there's an opportunity for um, individual ownership. So you have your own space, but there's a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, for shared meals, for shared um, activities, shared space. You know, it, it makes a whole lot of sense to me to have a small, if, you, if I were going to design my own co-housing, it would have a small farm associated with it and then have the opportunity for people to, to help and to work on that. You could also have your own individual garden, but to kind of look at self-reliance and how the community as a whole can provide as many resources for the members as possible. And like I say, you have privacy when you want it, but you have easy community because I think that's 
one of the things they say about our society is that there are a whole lot of people who are very lonely and who don't connect. And that a co-housing community to me sets up that opportunity. Hmm. And we may come back to that. Sure. This, this loneliness issue is huge. Um, I recently saw some stats coming out of Britain, what kind of damage it does to the economy. You know, not that, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. people always talk about the economy. All plays out there. Um, but I want to, before, before uh, somehow that falls under the table, food. Now, when you started to be really interested in food and especially the uh, production of food, a different than the, the technologically uh, produced food production, mm-hmm. um, again, it was not something people paid much attention to. Um, but now... Mm-hmm. Really, really, really. People are actually saying we could save the climate, save the planet, right? By by our changing our habits. What when we talk about foods? What what over the last quarter of a century have we found out about, about food? What do we really need? What you know? Uh, how much this pleasure? You know, tell talk a little bit about sure. food. Uh, I, it's a fascinating subject. So, you know, when I started gardening, I only wanted to do organic. I didn't want to have anything to do with the uh, you know poisons, things like that. So there was a there's a long history of organic gardening and farming. So I was tied into that group. But what's really exciting to me now is how that's evolved into more regenerative agriculture. So that kind of happened through permaculture. It happened through all sorts of steps. But this idea that instead of mining uh, our land for to for food, so getting rid of bugs, you know, using huge amounts of pesticides and herbicides and then applying all sorts of chemical fertilizers is not a very uh, sustainable system. And so it's really exciting to me to follow folks like Darren Doherty and, you know, kind of ongoing from the permaculture um, into regenerative ag. And then as I'm now, I'm still a tiny, tiny scale of a food producer, but I'm working with more folks in our watershed who you know, produce um, grass-fed beef, and and uh, there's some great folks doing really good work, and just seeing what can happen when you treat your food system differently, when you treat it as a living organism, or you at least acknowledge the power of not just the chemical fertilizers, but the power of the soil microbes, the power of the animal themselves, that inner relationship. Um, that's really exciting to me. And there's some folks doing a really good job in our watershed. You said you are a relatively small food producer. Mm-hmm. What is tiny? What what well so how many people can you feed? I don't I don't even know. I mean we sell at the farmers market and <laughs> yeah. we're probably one of the lowest income folks at the farmers market. Um, because Tomton Farm is there as a demonstration and education farm. Okay. So but it produces. It does produce. Right. Yes. So let's take the watershed. So that's mm-hmm. not that small. We are in Colorado. So, <laughs> so you know, this is a big place. Uh, the, the, what I'm what I'm getting at is, um, I'm trying to investigate that in a pragmatic way. And people tell me very often, farmers, that mm-hmm. they say, this is very sweet. This is great that you're doing this. But look on a global scale, you know, the world population and we need GMOs and we need all of that. Uh, and there's the camp that says, no, we don't. And there's the camp that said, you're crazy. Of course we do. Now, I guess I know where you're at. I firmly in the, uh, no, we don't need it. Yeah. yeah okay. So please make the case uh, and, and please explain to me and anybody, um, why can we do it in that way that, that you described? We've done it in the past. And of course, the argument is, well, the population is so much larger now. Um, We've just really perverted our agricultural system to to favor huge expanses of land, which then must be managed with fossil fuel burning equipment, which must be, um, you know, use the use of uh, herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers. So it's while that has produced a lot of food, I don't think it's long-term sustainable. And when you look at our systems, our natural systems and how we fit in there, um, we're at the very beginning of kind of putting these things together. 
And so for me, when, <clears throat> when we start talking about regenerative agriculture, we're just starting to scratch the surface of how we can do it. And I'm, I'm more interested in systems of uh, raising food like aquaponics and hydroponics and aeroponics than I am about increasing the expanse of flat land with, that's soaked in poisons. Ah, there's hiding a very good argument for feeding everybody. Please uh, expand. So growing food, not only. So we um, actually, it was, it, was, it was a pretty fun project that almost made it. Um, a realtor here in town came to me with the idea of doing an aquaponics greenhouse at the edge of town. And we went pretty far. Um, we talked to town council. We had designs. I did some training. And town council at that time decided it had to go to a vote of the people because it was a very controversial piece of property. And so it went to the vote of the people and it lost by 100 votes. Because if it didn't, if it hadn't, we would have a series of aquaponics greenhouses at the edge of town that could then traipse over to the local grocery store with fresh goods and talk about cutting your fossil fuel footprint and your carbon footprint. It would have been fun. It would have been really amazing. So those kinds of opportunities are out there. And I'm not saying, you know, we got to end agribusiness as we know it right now, but there are a lot of opportunities that in my mind are potentially being suppressed or certainly being poo-pooed or, you know, denigrated, which we should be going after full bore. What I find interesting is that when I think of you, I see you really like in the dirt and the people. <laughs> uh, and, but, but you're like a scientist also, no? So there's a, kind of, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the, the, what you're talking of, the hydroponics and so on and so forth. These are very old technologies, but, but now people are working at that with a lot of new technology. So you're not somebody who is adverse to technology per se, like let's all go back to the stone no, age. No, I'm not. I mean, there's part of me that likes that part of what I do, but it's not It's not for everybody. I mean, you know, we've gone from what, 80% of a farmer's nation to down to, we're not even a category on the census anymore. Uh, we need to, achieve a little bit better balance. Sorry, just, I have to get into that. You're not a category on the census. I think the, the, farmer, the is a... farmer, we've gone down to like less than 1% of the population as people who produce food. So the rest of the food is produced by very few people and a lot of machines? Most of the food is produced by very few people and a lot of machines. So hmm. instead of being a nation of farmers, you know, you read Thomas Jefferson, you read some of the early folks and that was the agrarian lifestyle was what our country was based on, and that's pretty rare. And very different styles. I mean, we both know the, the Mesa Verde region pretty well. Mm -hmm. They were all farmers. Yep. Different, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I try to copy some of their techniques, particularly the drought ones, instead of doing raised beds, which are great if you're in an area that gets moisture. You do sunken beds so that it concentrates the water. And that's what the natives did here, is they had these waffle gardens that worked way better than some of the systems that we've been trying to do. Nice bridge. So so there's, there's all the material stuff that goes into food production, but there seems to me a lot of psychology is also involved mm -hmm. in our relationship with food. I, I did somehow switch to ve vegetarianism without any fundamental thoughts behind it. It just was better for me. I still am pretty bulky <laughs> i say um uh, what is in your experience what what is it with our what is it with our psychology what what in your opinion we ought to really change um because you said we produce a lot of food yes indeed we do but we throw a lot of food away yes we do uh absolutely i mean i'm back home in europe i know that but i'm sure in the us it's, yeah. it's not different um so so psychology and food what's what's going on there who there's a lot going on there um i think when i you know, I've been a meat eater all my life. And then when I, you know, kind of kind of started to think about it, should I be, I figured if I, if I eat meat, I should be able to kill, kill an animal. And so I was able to do that. And then it also became more important to really look at where any meat I was going to, to intake, where it came from and how it was raised. Because I would agree that our current system of meat production on the large scale is, can be pretty horrific. And that kind of energy going into that system, and then we're consuming that, it just doesn't feel right. 
So we have some, like I say, we have laid back beef here in our watershed and they, they have amazing um, beef products. Laid back. Laid back. Laid back, laid back <laughs> beef, folks. Um, and, you know, Indian Ridge that does the chickens. And so as much as possible, we try to um, support our local food, you know, meat producers and veggie producers. Um, and knowing to me, I think, and I'm chatting with my daughter, who's a, of the age as well, knowing where your food come, comes from, whether it's meat or vegetables or anything, is really important. And then acknowledging, because there's there's some aspects of the vegan diet that are pretty disturbing. You know, if you look at uh, carbon footprint, if you look at where the materials are coming from, if you're looking at the variety that they're, you know, are they are they doing all organic? Are they doing products that are shipped halfway across the world? Um, so I, I'm not arguing philosophically against it. I just think let's be let's be really aware of all the systems involved in what we end up consuming. Let me take a step back because I just suddenly was reminded of what you said before about production and where farmers are at. Now, there is still a great influx into the cities, urbanization. Mm -hmm. um, and back home in Europe, we actually have an issue where cultural landscapes and farming landscapes are being abandoned. Now, with the farms and the machines that can some, uh, somehow be industrially farmed, so that's kind of working. But how do you see that, that balance between between land and city and feeding the cities in a way that they know where the food is coming from? You know, how do we implement that? Or do you see that the trend is going to change? I just, again, I'm, I'm the pragmatic optimist. I see some really cool things happening with rooftop gardens in cities, with these... Um, you know, the aquaponics and aeroponics techniques that can grow a huge amount of food in a small amount of space with a fairly low water and fairly low carbon footprint. So I think that's an opportunity to replace some of those vast areas of um, fields that we're doing. And then how about rewilding some of those areas? How about uh, bringing biodiversity back into some of those large farms? So, and it's, it's gonna be a careful, have to be a careful transition. But if we can feed more people in the cities from the cities, that's great. And then free up the notion of what the country is. I think they'll hopefully there'll always be folks like me who want to be out there and want to be digging in the dirt. Um, there could be more opportunity for folks to come visit that and partake in small amounts and kind of see how that old style growing worked. I, I just... Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity that we're barely starting to think about. What would happen if we really shifted the way we produce our food? I don't know yet, but it could be good. We let it well. We let it hang out there, but I just want to put you know say here at this point. Um, you, you mentioned that your farm is an educational place, mm -hmm. and I think that plays a huge role. So people who are interested in in those topics can go and ask somebody like you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it's, I, well, I had some folks email, I'm, I, I am on social media and, you know, there's homestead groups and there's greenhouse groups and I really like being able to share the experience. It's like, all right, well, what has worked for me? Um, you know, it, whether it's catching mice or, you know, um, covering your beds or what, you know, what kind of uh, lettuce works the best. So that's fun for me to be able to share that experience remotely and then also with the folks who come to the farm i've got a, a, a guy who works for town coming up because we're we're trying to push we're trying to get compost happening in our region it's been a long long time and it hasn't exactly worked yet so again part of that system is what do we do with our food waste and so but he's going to come up this weekend and um, visit the farm and, and see if there's an opportunity for a compost business well let's talk about that being at home in Austria, in the countryside, in the Waldviertel where I live, there's this guy, he's mad about compost. And he's, you know, like a prophet. And it works. He's like a way of doing it that is fantastic. And it's catching out. And a handful of it, you know. It's great like, stuff. It's great stuff. So so we talked about food a bit, not enough. But um, uh, but let's move on to the to the waste of it. So mm -hmm. so so what we got to do there? What we got to change? And and what what potential actually is in in the waste? So so again, it's to me it goes back to systems. I did some systems training with Gunter Pauli, and it's just if you if you're ignoring it, 
you, it's just you're not you don't have a solution. And so particularly in Telluride region, we import 100% of our food and export 100% of our waste. And so we are causing problems instead of solving problems. And yes, we have some particular challenges. We have, you know, with if we were to do a compost pickup service in the town of Telluride, there's a big bear issue. Um, there are regulatory issues in terms of you reach a certain size of dealing with other people's food waste and you have to go through the state permitting and we've worked to make that easier. So there's opportunities there and we're trying to um, optimize what we could do here. We actually have been working with the EPA on a study for <clears throat> two condominiums in the region and we, we characterized all the waste coming out of those two condominiums for a week. So this really hardy crew separated a week's worth of garbage into 22 categories. And basically 75% of what went into the dumpster could have been either recycled or composted. 75%? Yeah. So there is economic value yeah. in the... There's economic value not only for saving your trash fees, um, but also for producing something valuable that um, farmers, ranchers, even, I mean, just spreading compost in the forest, that would be a benefit you know, to increase the soil fertility everywhere. Our, our soils are challenged out here. So the kind of looking at systems design, look, looking at how your systems operate, um, I find that fascinating. It's like, where are we missing parts of a system? And that's a big part of the system that's missing. Do you have a <laughs> pragmatic optimist? Uh, do you have a feeling that's catching on? Do you have a feeling yes. that people, yeah? Yeah, so I was just on a policy call for the state for Recycle Colorado. And we're looking to do a bill to have an organics management plan at the state level. Uh, we can look to California, who's already done a lot of this. Um, and so we can kind of look at their systems and then tweak them, uh, hopefully, or maybe they need wholesale change for our region because we're, we're different. Um, but there's a lot more attention being paid to that, um, that opportunity. Um, it's not just a, you know, yeah, we're, we, we're very wasteful. We're actually in Colorado, we're quite bad at recycling uh, compared to the other states. And so we really need to increase that rate. And compost is one of the areas, particularly in rural areas, where um, that's a great opportunity for us. You you just mentioned California. Um, we recently had a really interesting talk to an ecologist and evolutionary biologists and people who uh, care and work uh, on the extinction mm -hmm. crisis that that we are, that we are having. Uh, and they said that in California. Um, um, they have pledged that there shall not be any more extinctions, so they're investing into that particular field. I'm bringing that up because you were talking Colorado is doing this, California is doing this, uh, and is it at the end of the day politics? Is it is it is politics that which implements change? Is that a reason why you've gone into politics? I'm trying to be elegant, but I'm not very elegant. So think, yeah. after all the things you've done and you keep on doing, you invest a lot of time and energy in the political arena. Why? There are levels of influence, right? So if I just do my own thing as a person, I, I could change my life and maybe my husband and maybe my family. Um, then when we kind of go up to the level that the farm is, I've influenced a lot of folks through my efforts at the farm, um, but it's still pretty minuscule. Uh, so when you move up into the political realm, um, you can influence a lot more people and it's much less direct, but the, the spread of the uh, opportunity is much bigger. So I, I really appreciate the county level of political work because people can call me and talk to me and I feel like I can you know, address specifics and I can, um, where we're all the commissioners are involved um, at the state level for, for trying to um, improve things, you know, make things a little bit better. Um, and it just feels like at this level, you can actually make a difference. I, I don't know, going beyond this level, <laughs> um, how, how effective, I don't think I would be good at it because I think I would be too frustrated. But at this level, it can work. And it's, I mean, we're working on things for soil health in a 
at, at our county, payment for ecosystem services. So basically trying to encourage, what we're trying to do is find a way to get funds into the hands of farmers and ranchers who are willing to, um, who either are operating in regenerative fashion or who are willing to change practices to more regenerative practices. Um, change to things that are improving soil health and improving soil water quality and, and the holding capacity. Um, so that's what that's one of the things we're working on at the county level that Art Good Times started, um, is to look at, well, what can we do at this level? Um, we're, we still haven't figured out the pot of money that, that we want to you know, funnel to our farmers and ranchers, but we want to have the um, sort of the evaluation and the process in place. So we're working on that right now. Do you find that on that level of people's actual homes that maybe there are ideological differences, which can be huge? I'm saying that because we just traveled the country and, mm -hmm. and it's very, very um, scary to me, you know, the rhetoric and, 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 and the way people talk about each other and, yeah. and how they demean each other's worldviews. Um, would you say if it comes to the point where it's about your little town, your food and so on, that it's easier to deal with that? Is that maybe a recipe for the world? <laughs> well, certainly everybody eats. And so it is a place of common ground. And I think what I've learned most from the political aspect is a little more respect for divergent opinions um, and a little more... Um, a gentler way of trying to present, you know, a particular idea or thought or, you know, the ed education, a lot of it has to go through education. We are, we are constantly bombarded with, you know, this fact or that fact or this not fact. Um, and so I think part of it is, is being gentle with people. Um, but at a certain point you have to, you know, you have to stay put and say, well, this is my value and this is what I value. I, it's been interesting because we, I'm the rep on a, on a relatively conservative Western Slope organization. And so, and Art was on it too. Um, and so it's been very interesting to go in. We have uh, policy committees and subcommittees on, you know, water and energy and land use and um, telecommunications and transportation. And when I first went, I was like, wow, probably 80 percent of this we actually agree on and then you come up to certain places where you're just like oops not there energy was one of them because a lot of the folks um, in that organization were very very pro oil and gas and so that was kind of one of the rude awakenings it's like oh um, but still trying to learn to speak the language and introduce ideas and introduce sort of uh fact checks in a way um has been interesting we had a call today about electronic vehicles and a resolution about EVs in this state because they're not, they don't pay a gas tax and the gas tax is what funds a lot of the improvements to the roads. So is there an equitable way for the growing number of EVs to contribute to um, our roads? So it's, it's been fascinating. And I do think you have to choose your battles uh, but you have to be careful of your language. When Art was starting on this payment for ecosystem services um, event, um, he wanted to call it carbon sequestration. And my thing was like, let's call it soil health because there are a lot of people who don't want to think about carbon and think it's a hoax and you know think global warming is a hoax and there's still people out there who are like that. Um, but it's very hard to be against healthy soil. So that's part of it is just understanding how how people's minds work and how how to um, invite them in to a conversation as opposed to bludgeon them with your information. Mm. So. I think I let that part now stand where it's at. That's I think that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask people really simple questions because then I get an overview of what different people think. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that. Sure. So you talked about briefly, you mentioned climate change. You studied forestry, you studied horticulture. Mm -hmm. I think we can, we can trust your word if you say something is happening. You obviously 
say something is happening. Um, but it's not the only thing that's happening. So amongst all the things that are happening, <laughs> what scares you the most? Art, as we've been bringing you up, is it? I am too old. I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. But but is there something particular, maybe something that we don't see or don't think about that really worries you? Where you say, if we don't address this ASAP yesterday, uh, uh, then we're in deep trouble. Well, I do think climate change is the one that could really significantly alter our future as a species. Um, it's highly complicated and complex. And there's so many facets to it. But I think parallel to that, certainly in this country, is the division among people and how we have lost civility and we've lost the ability to disagree. I think that is, um, you know, the one is sort of the environmental aspect. You know, we could we could screw up this planet to the point where we can't live here anymore. And the other is the human species aspect. We could screw up our the way we deal with each other to the point where you know, we're, we're going to be irrelevant as a species. And the pragmatic optimist in me says, well, we're going to do the best we can, but if we fail, we're just another failed species. <laughs> you know, I, and I do think, you know, I'm talking to one of my fellow commissioners who has a young, a, um, I think she's like two, you know, she's, she's quite young. Um, and, uh, and sort of that idea that, boy, did, do you want to bring a, a child into this world? And he had to think about it a lot. And I was like, one of the things as a parent I think we must do is do the very best we can to give our kids the tools to deal with what they're going to deal with. We don't, I mean, I've done the best I could to um, to address some of the issues, you know, by growing organically, by living off grid. But more important to me for, for my kids is that they, um, they have a sense of self-reliance. They know that they can learn. They know that they can respond to challenges um, that are coming up and uh, and be resilient humans and in whatever environment they end up in. Hopefully they can make it. But pragmatic optimist pragmatic stance. Optimist. We're going to, I mean, I think the to me, we have to do everything we can to make it a better place, to right the wrongs we've done, to... Um, stop systems that are eroding to help with the species extinction where we can, but we're not going to be able to do it all. Um, I, I do think it's kind of exciting again, sort of that technology part. There's stuff that we haven't even, we don't have a clue that's going to come out. Am I going to rely on that to save the world? No, I'm going to be excited when it comes out, but um, I'm still going to chug along with the stuff that I know how to do and that I can affect um, and hope, hope that something really cool does happen. I was, there was a movie called The Need to Grow that showed um, a greenhouse in Montana that's taking waste uh, through pyrolysis, making biochar, heating a space. So it was just a fascinating um, technological advancement. And then the place burned down, potentially nefariously, I'm not sure. Uh, but now it's been rebuilt. So I mean, there's technologies out there. There's things that are going to happen that are going to blow us away. Hopefully in a really good way, not the bad way. Um, and so this will be fun to see. But in the meantime, I'm not going to hold my breath or you know stop what I'm doing to, to wait for it because there's no the timeline is not under my control. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to show that to my little baby boy and say there's there's hope. <laughs> there is hope. There's hope. And you know, my when my daughter was 13, you know, so they've lived off grid their whole life, my both my kids, and uh, we're aware that you know if she wanted to use the hair hair dryer. She had to go start the generator because our solar power system was small. Um, but when she was 13, she's like, you know, you you guys tell us what to do for 18 years and then you hand us this world that you've totally effed up and we're supposed to fix it. And she said, you should be listening to us now. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. So I put her and her friend on the board of my nonprofit because I, I absolutely agree with it. Um, you know, the, we do not engage our youth um, enough. We do not give them, in my opinion, the tools, the, the mental tools to know that they are loved and that they should um, experiment and that they, um, you know, they should fail constantly, you know, instead of succeed. It's like, no, the failure is how you learn. So part of that is, is supporting those folks. And over time with the farm interns, I've found that too, that there's one, there's a 
there's an interesting period when kids come out of college when they're kind of, you know, they can't go back home and but they kind of miss family and this the the ones who were around when my kids were little really appreciated just a a touch of a family but also just the encouragement encouragement to do what they felt called to do and i think we try to we pigeonhole our youth too much we want them to you know get through college and get a job right away and and instead of doing like the the folks in new zealand do or in europe you know take a gap year and explore and do stuff and i i hope we're moving away from you got to go to college and do this to explore. If you don't want to go to college, you know, go do a trade school or you know, do something different. So I feel that expansion of opportunity is important. I liked it. Expansion of opportunity. 